I believe we can start the session soon. Yes, welcome to the next session, um, which is uh, about the EOSC interoperability architecture and fair data aspects. It's um, a session which uh, will be divided into three sub-sessions, breakout sessions, uh, after half an hour from now. Um, we will use uh, the next 30 minutes to uh, introduce into the breakout sessions um, by uh, three speakers. Um, first, I want to remind you that the sessions will be uh, the sessions will be recorded, also the breakout sessions, and will be made um, available afterwards. And please stay muted and keep your uh, video off uh, during the presentations. Um, you can ask your questions uh, in the chat, and um, um, should get them answered either by uh, colleagues or um, by the speakers. Um, these are the three sub-sessions that we are planning uh, for now. So the, um, the overall idea is that um, the um, interoperability uh, has aspects, general aspects of services across uh, different domains, different um, provider domains are to be combined um, so they are and also the interoperability between um, uh, services and core services play a role on the one hand side and on the other hand side there are um, interoperability aspects to be tackled with regard to resources and especially the data resources so the fair data implementation here plays an important role as well as um, and as a part of that um, metadata interoperability. So we have uh, actually um, two uh, breakout sessions with regard of that and one breakout session here mentioned in the middle um, on the um, architecture and interoperability guidelines that have been developed um, in the context of the EOS Cup project being uh, proposed to the EOSC. Um, I will briefly introduce the first speaker uh, for the first breakout session. It is Javi Lours, Lours uh, of the UK uh, Data Service uh, and uh, representing Shock here. Um, uh, Javi is a repository and uh, preservation manager at the UK Data Archive, uh, which is a lead partner in the UK Data Service, which is a SESTA member. Um, he's working on the SHOCK project, uh, mainly on trustworthy digital repositories, uh, and is also involved in that, uh, in the similar area, in the FAIRS FAIR project, and uh, leads that the SESTA Trust Working Group. Um, Harvey, please, it's your turn. Hi there. So hopefully you can see my screen about now. Yes, um, we do. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'll be providing a brief introduction to the fair data implementation, uh, the aspects covering extending the portfolio of EOSC services with fair data repositories. And I'm Hervé Lors, as has been mentioned from uh, both Shock and the UK Data Service. Um, the two presentations you'll see in the breakout in a little while are uh, the first one, integrating EOSC services to enable FAIR principles, and secondly, uh, shock repositories, core trust seal, and FAIR. Um, first of all, you'll hear from our colleague uh, Olivier Rouchon, who's uh, from CINES and uh, working on the EOSC Hub project, covering the integration of EOSC services to enable the FAIR principles. Um, this will be probably an introductory and more practical session to, to look at some of the key components um, of, the, uh, of the systems here, uh, followed on by something that's a bit more standards based, I would expect. <clears throat> uh, the key focus here is looking at long term preservation and fair. Uh, long term preservation, as you'll see here, from planning to collecting, processing, publishing, preserving and reusing data is just one phase in the research data lifecycle, but, but a critical one. 
Um, and within that phase, it addresses most of the principles of FAIR, um, particularly through the use of persistent identifiers, uh, managing provenance, ensuring authentication measures are in place. But I think as with all of these aspects, there is room for improvement. Um, and one of the key aspects here that, that we'll talk through in both presentations really is that um, it includes a time parameter, which is not yet considered within FAIR and the, and the um, and then sort of turning fair into a reality reports that we've seen prior to now. Um, Olivier's report will be looking in a little bit more detail at some of the underlying services uh, that are coming out of uh, EOS Cub, uh, how the ETDR that he is uh, managing as part of CNES is uh, being built into that portfolio of services, uh, looking at the issue of risks, both in terms of knowledge base formats, media technology, uh, the key aspect of quality assurance and how you provide that as a service. Um, the policies that need to be in place to ensure that digital information remains available and understand understandable over time. These are two key aspects here. Um, and how kind of CNES and EOSC hubs catalog has now been integrated into beta access, beta safe, beta handle, beta find into this sort of new ETDR model, which is providing a preservation service uh, within the catalog. Um, you'll see a lot more detail about that at the point. I'll be following that up, looking at SHOC, uh, the repository support program that is coming out of SHOC um, and different elements of core trust seal and FAIR. Um, <clears throat> taking a step back up to kind of the wider vision of, uh, of the EOSC at the moment, two of the key aspects that you'll see here across repositories, people and objects, um, are the increasing work to be able to do object evaluation, both automated and manual, um, and place these on digital objects, not just at the repository phase of the life cycle, but um, throughout the different phases of the life cycle. But across the theme here, digital preservation or repositories, the repository as an actor here is, is, is the maintainer is, is a key concept. Um, put most simply and gone to in more detail in the presentation itself, um, we'll be looking at um, the interactions between a repository which contains its objects and the multiple collections that might be represented there and how uh, the object is influenced by being contained by a repository. One of the uh, lenses that we'll look at this through is the core trust seal, which is a core level baseline trustworthy digital repository standard, um, which provides 16 requirements uh, covering organizational infrastructure, digital object management and technology. We won't go into these in detail now, but we'll cover broadly the different aspects and the influence that these have on the object context that they provide. Core trust seal has been around for a while. And in the end of this introduction, I'll just show a, a diagram which you'll see on um, both of the presentations that Olivia and I will give today. Um, this is some of the emerging work to map uh, the core trust seal against the FAIR principles. Uh, the principles here have been mapped not just directly against the, uh, the conceptual uh, requirements originally provided, but also against the RDA FAIR data working groups uh, indicators, which provide a little bit more granularity uh, and information about how we can how we can interpret, apply, and eventually define metrics and tests for the alignment between FAIR and the core trust seal. Um, you'll see here that there is a strong relationship between the two, um, and we'll be looking at through the work that Olivier is doing in uh, integrating those services which deliver different aspects of this and uh, through the work that I'll be presenting, uh, looking at the different different ways that a repository can provide a context that really enables the fairness of data. And as you'll have seen briefly in Olivier's presentation, which I'll go into in more detail, how um, the core trust seal plus time element, the fair plus time element, really gives us an assurance that data will remain preserved available and usable for the future. So uh, I hope to speak to you further for those of us who can uh, join that session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Javi. Um, the next speaker uh, will be uh, Giacinto uh, Don Vito, uh, 
Jacinto, you can al already share your screen while I introduce you. Um, so Jacinto will share the uh, breakout session on architecture and interoperability guidelines. He is uh, from INFN. Uh, and represents also EOS Cup here. Um, he's INFN senior technologist, uh, the technical coordinator of the EOS Cup project and the chair of the technical committee in EOS Hub. Um, he was the technical uh, coordinator um, of the Indigo Data Cloud project and uh, in the Extreme Data Cloud uh, EU project. And he's also INFN representative for the Italian Alexir and LifeWatch Joint Research Unit. And he is also work package leader in different uh, national infrastructure projects um, with the aim of implementing um, uh, distributed computing platforms for scientific applications in physics, Alexia, LifeWatch. So please, um, Giacinto. Thank you, Jonas, for uh, this nice introduction. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, but you uh, show currently um, not the full screen, just for your information, but uh, we can yeah, see Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. no, that, that, that's just to be sure. Uh, I don't have any surprise in not thank working, you. sharing, etc. Well, okay, thanks. Well. So um, I would very uh, briefly introduce uh, uh, the topic of the parallel session we will have uh, at 12 o'clock. Uh, basically, here we will talk about uh, the uh, service composability and interoperability guidelines that we are working on in the context of EOSCAB, but uh, even further um, trying to uh, uh, join also other effort and uh, uh, stakeholder in this uh, initiative. The main uh, focus why we are working on uh, uh, those uh, topics is because in our opinion, going uh, uh, towards the service integration and composability framework, uh, giving uh, those uh, guidelines that we are uh, proposing will facilitate and are already facilitating in a lot of uh, communities the exploitation of the EOSC services, but also this uh, help uh, the developers to combine the, use, the usage of uh, different EOSC services together. This means that at the end, uh, the, the scientist, the researcher could compose their own services in a much easier way uh, just because, for example, they rely on well-established and uh, uh, well-supported uh, uh, EOSC compliant services for implementing uh, their solutions. Just to make some examples, obviously having uh, uh, the possibility to rely on uh, a federated and common uh, services uh, give the possibility to EC uh, interoperate at level of AI or assessing protocols or monitoring accounting and those uh, kind of stuff. Uh, which is the uh, main uh, objective here is to propose the adoption of standards in terms of uh, uh, well-known both protocols and APIs. And uh, uh, with this approach, the idea is to support end-to-end possibility of the service. Um, just to make some very quick examples, we have already different um, examples of uh, uh, those uh, um, uh, those activities. For example, there is a, a thematic services already in production that is made of different EOSC services already available that they are joining together in order to provide a more complete and easy to use uh, high level services, for example, for the data analytics like uh, the DODAS thematic services, or even at the higher level, if you have already uh, use of, uh, usable services in a specific community context like uh, the uh, health observation environment, you may compose those services together in order to have a more advanced uh, scientific workflow already ready to use instead of uh, writing everything from scratch. In order to, to make this effort, we started with a very general approach in how to define a reference architecture. Basically, we use the approach of defining building blocks uh, with the basic elements, very simple um, definition, uh, the scope of these building blocks, which, is, which are the feature, which are the standard user, which are the APIs, etc. This kind of approach is useful because we can use the same 
exactly the same approach for defining federation services together with the common services that are much more ready to be used services, but even uh, community uh, specific thematic services. And all those services could be really described in the same approach, obviously providing different information. Um, the, the general way we do this work is that obviously we start defining uh, those building blocks. Uh, we start defining the technical specification uh, for each of the building blocks. We go back to share those information with the community, with the people involved, uh, gain more experience, uh, involve uh, external people, try to use this feedback uh, to improve the description of uh, uh, those building blocks. How the building blocks is uh, composed, uh, basically, first of all, a building blocks describe similar services. So not at a specific one specific services, but similar services. They uh, all together are interoperable, provide similar functions. And um, for example, uh, have concrete examples. I mean, concrete services running into the EOSC that could be described. What is composing um, a typical template for a, a given building block? There is an introduction where we describe which is the function, the main function of these building blocks. Then we provide a reference architecture for the services, how the building blocks is made uh, eventually internally and uh, uh, provide information about which are the adopted standard from that building blocks. So eventually giving uh, official reference to official standard, etc. Then we provide information about uh, interoperability, how other services could interact with these specific services, how um, these specific services could interoperate with others, etc. And then at the end, we have examples of solution already implementing that specification. Uh, so to, to make a more visual uh, description of this, at the end, we will have a definition of um, functions via those building blocks that could be used in order to develop, for example, a new thematic services. So you pick in the list of the building blocks the feature you need. And then you know how to interact with that specific feature, which are the APIs, which are the standard, which are the protocols used. And eventually, if there is a service that could be joined with another because they are, I don't know, compatible interfaces, et cetera, you know this from the description. And then you can eventually uh, bridge together more than one services in order to uh, develop a, uh, your uh, thematic solution. Uh, we already have provided uh, quite a good list of uh, description in the official web page of EOSCAM project. You see here the link and you will see there there is a lot of categories, which we call thematic areas, uh, cloud compute, for example, HPC, HTC, metadata management, et cetera, et cetera. There is a lot of those. And in each of that thematic area, you will have eventually more than one uh, building block, depending on the complexity of uh, each of the thematic area. Uh, here, uh, there is um, uh, two examples of uh, uh, requests for feedback. We are um, asking the community involved uh, or exploiting those specific services to provide uh, feedback on our um, building block uh, definition. So this would help us to improve the uh, definition and to have a more um, widely uh, supported uh, description and eventually increase the, uh, the number of services that are somehow uh, using the same interoperability guidelines. Thank you. Obviously, there will be uh, much more details in the uh, parallel session, specifically devoted to uh, three different uh, thematic areas that are the uh, compute, cloud compute, uh, pass orchestration, and uh, um, data access uh, uh, and analysis. Thank you. This was my uh, initial introduction. Thank you very much, Giacinto. We have then the next uh, speaker is um, Marie Clemola. She's a development uh, manager at the Finnish Social Science Data Archive. 
from the Tampere University. Uh, she's also representing uh, Shock. Um, she has 20 years of experience in digital data preservation and open science. And she's leading the SESTA tools and services working group. She's a member of the core trust seal board and the DDI Alliance expert committee. She has participated in several European uh, social science and humanity research infrastructure projects and at the moment she is active in the EOSC Nordic and Shock. So Marie, it's your turn. Marie, we don't hear you if you speak. You're muted. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Can you uh, did you see my screen? Yes. And can you still see it? I mean, the PowerPoint presentation or? Yes, works well. And okay, we can hear great. you. Thank you. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, very happy to be here today. Uh, so the third presentation uh, uh, in our parallel sessions will be uh, hey, sorry, about... ju just to stop you. I think that we see a background now. It is uh, okay. the trees. I'm sorry, I thought this is part of the presentation, no, sorry. No, but it's a nice view from where I live, my, so this is Finland. <laughs> my fault. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you, Irena. So now? Yes, great. Uh, so we will... Uh, I have two screens and I'm sorry. Uh, so the third parallel session will be about metadata interoperability. Uh, shock and beyond and basically I, I think it will be about standards meeting reality so uh, it's uh, this is very uh, practical presentations we will have by myself and by Claudia Martens uh, and, and uh, just as a background uh, uh, I, I'm sure everybody here knows these fair principles about interoperability. Uh, so basically, uh, we will have uh, research data objects uh, or metadata objects, uh, and they can be interoperable only if, if the uh, metadata and data are machine actionable. And uh, I mean, in today's session, we will focus on the metadata aspects. Uh, metadata should uh, utilize shared vocabularies, uh, ontologies, and uh, yeah, metadata should be uh, syntactically possible and also semantically machine accessible. So a lot of uh, demands here and a lot of requirements. Uh, and I, I think that, uh, well, uh, work in several projects, like uh, I've also involved in the Nordic EOSC project and we've been doing a verification uh, work there. And it has shown that many repositories have uh, problems, especially with their uh, interoperability aspects. And this is a very demanding field. Uh, so in, in our session about metadata interoperability, SOC and beyond, uh, we are not going to tackle everything. We will have a, a very, uh, in a way, a narrow view on interoperability. We will be talking about uh, a metadata format diversity, uh, the use cases uh, for domain-specific metadata, and uh, uh, as well as for common standards. Uh, we will be, uh, I, I especially will be talking about the forthcoming conversion hub we are developing in the SOC project, and uh, Claudia will focus on uh, EOSC hub and uh, enhanced discoverability. Uh, across research areas uh, and, and, and further developments. So it's uh, going to be a very practical session and we are hoping to get a lot of questions and uh, uh, from you and also uh, we hope to have a good discussion. Uh, we, we want to know what is useful for researchers, uh, what is useful for research infrastructures and, and I mean, just basic things and advice hints. Uh, and we do have already thoughts on how to integrate metadata uh, from all scientific domains. Uh, there will be different standards and, and so on. 
uh, we will also, especially Claudia, will focus on peer to find uh, and, and share issues and experiences from peer to find work uh, uh, and, and how to support various metadata schemas and standards. So I think this will be very uh, practically focused session uh, and uh, I'm hoping to see many of you there and uh, also participating in the discussion. I think you will need to go to the auditorium and then choose another room uh, for the room for this metadata interoperability session or any other room you want to go into. Uh, but really hoping to see you there uh, in the, the next, I, I think, five minutes or so. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much, Marie. Um, so we are pretty well in time. Uh, I'm just checking if someone already asked a question in the chat. No, this is not the case. So then I would say we use the time to switch to our breakout sessions um because uh, of these interesting topics that we will have there so see you later in the next sessions thank you very much okay bye bye So just to add, uh, there are three parallel sessions and uh, yeah, the ones that are interesting in uh, architecture and interoperability guidelines should go into another room in the auditorium. And also there's a parallel session on metadata interoperability, interoperability shock and beyond. So you state now in, in the session of fair data implementation and Johannes will introduce more of the session and the speakers. Johannes, may I invite you to start the session, please? Yes, thank you very much. I was just waiting for 12, for the noon clock. <laughs> thank you. So yes, welcome to the um, breakout session on uh, fair data implementation, extending the portfolio of your services with fair data repositories. Um, the um, idea here is to um, inform a bit or go more into details with regard to services, data services, which are about the fair, um, which bring fairness um, um, into the game. And um, so the, um, as the abstract already says that um, uh, we will first focus on um, the EOS more in the practical uh, aspects, as uh, have you already introduced, um, on the in 
integration of uh, trusted digital repositories into the uh, EOSC um, framework. And um, here, especially long-term preservation repositories. Um, and um, this will be a presentation from Olivier Rochon. And um, uh, he will also address uh, the fair principles and aspects of certifications as Javier then in the next um, um, part of um, the, um, this um, uh, session will do. Um, Javier will uh, more um, go into details of uh, the social science and humanity um, aspects, uh, the repositories which are there in this domain, uh, while Olivier has a more a generic view um, and will present this more from the core services um, aspects. Um, so, um, and Javi will then also address uh, a bit more in detail the core trust seal concept. Uh, because tr trustworthiness of data repositories uh, is not given uh, per se. Uh, there, it is necessary to have the right regulations in place, uh, which we have in a more or less lean but effective way with the trust core trust seal framework. So um, in summary, uh, this is uh, a session which uh, with three uh, topics. So the first talk will be by Olivier, the next by uh, Harvey, and then we have a questions answer session. So we are also keen to get your feedback and questions with regard um, to um, the uh, community requirements and but also expertise uh, from others um, with the integration of uh, trusted, trusted digital repositories into the um, into the ESC. So I would like to give the floor to Olivier Rochon um, while I uh, briefly introduce him. Um, so, so Olivier, you can already set up your, your slides. Um, Olivier has uh, graduated as a computer science engineer. Uh, and uh, had various uh, stints uh, with uh, French uh, ISPs. And he spent seven years at Dell and uh, as an IT project manager. And in 2006, he joined the CNES, uh, which is a French national data center for higher education research. And uh, he had uh, different management positions in software development before leading the digital preservation department. He's a member of the core trust seal assembly of reviewers and um, is involved in the European projects such as EOS Cup, Fairs Fair, and EOS Pillar. So, Olivier, please. Uh, thank you very much, Johannes. Um... Good morning. Hi, uh, everybody. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. 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 Oh, okay. And you can see my screen, yeah? Yes. yes. Okay. So, um, as Johannes said, I'm Olivier Rouchon. I'm the head of the digital preservation department at CINES. CINES is uh, uh, one of the three national data centers in France but it's the only one that has the long-term preservation mandate in it in its statutes right so we've been doing um long-term preservation at the national level for uh, more than 15 years now um so we've got great um experience um of, of this kind of services uh, I am also leading the task 6.5 in uh, the EOSC uh, project, which is due to finish by the end of this year, and in, which is one of the organizers of this conference. And my objectives as part of, uh, of the task 6.5 leader was to deploy a long-term preservation service at the European level and um, hopefully have it added to the um, EOSC and portfolio services. So that's what we call the ETDR. ETDR um, uh, is an acronym from, for European Trusted Digital Repository. 
And um, we'll see now how uh, these long-term preservation service can take advantage of uh, many um, uh, services offered by EOSCA, which can uh, enable some fair principles. So the, the, this is a, a, a quick re reminder of what long-term preservation is about. Um, it's about uh, preserving digital content, digital objects, but both from a, a substance point of view and a form point of view, right? Um, it also includes um, a, a time parameter, so it's uh, on the long term, which means that not just the duration of a project, three, five years, but uh, over decades, right? So um, a long term preservation action can continue even when a project uh, has uh, finished. And um, also, one of the main objectives is to make those uh, digital objects accessible. Right. So, um, if you <clears throat> if you don't implement some some long term preservation action, you will have to deal with uh, um, four risks that will happen. Um, that, that that's for sure. Uh, um, the first one is that you will uh, lose the the knowledge of the content. You you will no longer know what your files or object uh, uh, contain. Um, another risk. Uh, potential is a uh, potential risk is the file format obsolescence. Say um, uh, 30 years ago, the, the file format that were used for text file or even for uh, um, uh, data sets uh, were not the ones that we, were, we are using at the moment. So uh, something that had been generated 30 years ago could well be that you cannot uh, read it any longer. Um, that's the same thing for the, the storage media. Um, uh, when I was a student, we used to use floppy disks uh, or, 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 or tapes, and, and that has evolved to um, uh, SSD uh, uh, storage media and things like that. So um, 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 an evolution that you need to take into account. And the software and hardware obsolescence, that, that's the exact same. Um, uh, you have now um, some... Uh, um, hardware that has disappeared, such as uh, uh, disk drives and, and things like that, or CD drives, right? So there's a number of actions that you need to put in place to mitigate those risks when they will occur. And if you don't do that, then you will lose your data. So this is what we do in a, a long-term uh, preservation repository. Um, we use metadata and persistent identifiers to uh, uh, make sure that we uh, uh, keep the knowledge of the, the, the content of the object. Uh, we have a limited set of uh, maps that we can manage. Uh, and these are the ones that for which we have expertise and for which we have developed some tools to uh, do some uh, uh, validation and uh, identification. The, re, the rationale for that is that um, in case of file format obsolescence, we will convert those uh, files to another file format that will give us some uh, insurance for the next 30 years or so. Um, we have some uh, tools for uh, supervision to, um, um, uh, to uh, prevent those uh, uh, um, um, physical problems and, and errors and, and do the um, physical migration be, before um, uh, um, a, a media goes, uh, goes down. Um, everything is done with uh, technology watching and anticipation. Um, we need to be proactive to make sure that if uh, uh, new standards emerge, um, we can uh, incorporate them to our solution. So long-term preservation is about capacity and resource planning. Um, we will uh, implement the uh, techniques and technologies that I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, and this applies to um, uh, born digital and to digitize information as well. Um, and again, the objective is to um, 
ensure the information remains available all the time and in the long term. So um, you've got on this slide the um, research uh, data life cycle. Um, as you can see, the, the preservation is one of the items in the, in the life cycle. Uh, it's at the very end, but as I said earlier, um, um, it's, it's, it, it doesn't finish when a, a, a research project ends, right? Um, um, and that time parameter is really, really important because the technical choice that you will make at the uh, at planning phase of your research uh, when you collect the data can have a, a, a huge impact on, on your ability to preserve the data all the time. Um, so where do we uh, fit in, in the FAIR principles with the long-term preservation? Um, we already use persistent identifier, we use provenance um, metadata, desc description, descriptive metadata, we have some authentication processes uh, to um, uh, make sure of uh, who uh, deposit data, but there's always room from, for improvement, right? And having some reliable uh, tools that um, implement some of the principles of the uh, uh, fair best practices yeah, is a good thing. So for this reason, we decided to add some existing EOSCAP services and integrate them to uh, our, our long-term preservation repository in order to enable uh, those uh, FAIR principles. So we integrated four services. Um, those EOSCAP um, services are called a uh, B2 prefix. So basically B2 access is the service that um, offers an authentic authentication and authorization uh, uh, um, process. Um, B2 safe will be used for um, uh, file uh, uh, transfer or data set transfer. Um, the B2 handle is the one that you, we, we have um, used for the uh, persistent identifier generation. And B2 find um, is the tool of choice for um, um, metadata and, um, exposition or publication and harvesting. Um, I think that uh, Claudia um, um, will present this in another session that, that uh, takes place um, at the same time as this one. So this is the way uh, we've integrated everything. At, at the bottom of the, the, the picture, you've got European Trusted Digital Repository, which um, um, mixes the um, assurance quality services that we have implemented, file format verification, checksums, antivirus, um, potentially OCR generation and things like that, plus um, the um, archiving in the long term. And we've interfaced all this with the, the B2 services. So B2 save, B2 handle, and B2 find, as I mentioned earlier. Um, for example, the B2 handle um, service is very convenient because you will generate um, persistent identifier and you will also uh, declare the API, which can be used to uh, resolve those PIDs and access them. So this can be done through the, for example, uh, the handle.net website, but on the screen, uh, a sample of um, a, a PID, um, a, a digitizer herbarium from a, um, a museum, a French museum. And um, if you type this uh, or copy and paste this uh, PID in the um, uh, web interface, you will get directly to the data set, right? So this uh, uh, enable citation and, and things like that in, in, in publication, and, and, and that's one of the uh, FAIR uh, uh, requirements. So basically, uh, by doing all this, we've been able to um, include the ETDR in the EOSCAB uh, catalog. So you've got the link uh, to the um, and you are, can have the description of the um, 
of the service itself. Um, we've, uh, so th this was done through the, the um, ETDR instance at Seamless, but one of the partner in EOS Club uh, was Dance in the Netherlands, and they tried to demonstrate the feasibility of integrated, integrating another uh, B2 service, uh, which is B2Share, uh, instead of our B2Safe, uh, to do the, the, the file transfer. So that's a, a proof of concept that was successful. Uh, we've uh, updated the B2Share code. Um, it's been published on GitHub. It's not yet in production, but it, it, it should be in the coming months or, or, or years. Um, we are currently working on the business model. Um, at, at the moment, uh, on the national level, um, it's an annual fee that the communities have, have, have to pay uh, so on, a, on a yearly basis. Um, in France, we've got something like 20 plus communities uh, using our, our service. Um, at the European level, it's, it's a fresh paint uh, as we speak. So uh, we haven't got any uh, communities using it so far. Um, the business model uh, is subject to change. Um, don't know if you uh, attended the um, EOSC symposium, uh, at the end of October, there was a half a day uh, dedicated to the um, EOS services business model. It's not yet completely clear um, what will be the, the, the business model of choice. So um, this, um, this one could be subject to change uh, uh, going forward. Now, um, how uh, with all those uh, fair principle implemented plus um, uh, long-term preservation best practices. How can I bring some trust to my user um, and uh, um, have them using that ETDR? Because, um, I mean, as I said, long-term is, is quite a, a lot of time and, and how can I guarantee that I um, will be there in, say, uh, 20, 30 years and still manage those uh, data sets that, that, that have been deposited on my uh, um, platform. Well, that, that can be done through um, certification. So th there's been um, a, a European certification framework put together something like uh, uh, five or six years ago, maybe, maybe more. Uh, it's a three-level framework and uh, Code Trust Seal is the, 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 the building block, the, the basis of, of this uh, European certification framework. So the, the, the core trust seal he, um, was created, I think, um, three or four years ago, maybe five years ago. Um, and they will be able to confirm that later on. Uh, it replaces the data seal of approval and the world data system certifications um, that uh, were created um, at the beginning of uh, the um, 2000 um, uh, years. Um, the core trust seal is um, a self-assessment done by the uh, uh, repository uh, uh, himself. Uh, it's based on uh, 16 criteria, um, which um, uh, mixes technical information and organization. Um, you will see that the FAIR principle mainly addressed technical uh, 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 choices or details such as uh, formats and metadata. Um, the Core Trust Seal has also an organizational uh, uh, um, side, which is very important. Um, at the moment, we've got a little bit more than 100 of uh, repositories which have been certified. It's open to any kind of data repositories. Uh, and um, the certification process is done through um, using a, um, a, an online tool. Um, and uh, when the application is done, then a reviewer, peer reviewers, uh, will uh, evaluate the application. As um, Joannes uh, said earlier, uh, in addition to contributing to the EOS Cub uh, project, I'm also uh, uh, um, participating into the First Fair uh, project. Um, so first fair um, has one word package dealing with the core trust seal and how we can map 
the uh, 16 uh, criteria to the 15 FAIR principles. So that's part of the work that's been done since the beginning of the project. You've got an overview on our findings. Um, as you may see, um, so you've got the F, A, I, and R uh, uh, principles for FAIR, and the, the, the ones with an R, uh, say R13, R15, uh, are the, the, um, the criteria from the, um, um, the core trust scene. Um, again, the, the, the mapping is very on the technical side of things because there are no um, organizational uh, consideration into the third principles. And that's poten potentially one of the weak aspects of third principles. Uh, as Hervé uh, said earlier, there's no uh, time parameter into third. Uh, so fair is pretty much a snapshot, a snapshot, something that's fair today could not be fair in 10 years of, of time. And that's what long-term preservation tries to address. Uh, so um, I, we could, could say, and Hervé will say that uh, uh, later, uh, we could say that fair plus time equals uh, long-term preservation. Um, as part of FAST Fair, we are also put in place a, a certification support program. There's been an uh, open call for repository, uh, and we will assist and uh, support them um, so that they can get through the uh, Core Trust SEAL certification uh, application successfully. And there's also a, a joint activity between EOS Club and FAST Fair. Um, to have the um, ETDR uh, uh, certified with the core trust seal as well. Um, the the um, long-term preservation repository at CINES um, uh, had been certified with the data seal of approval, but that was back at the, um, I think, 2014 or something like that. We need now to move on and, and do another application for the ETDR uh, and, um, and the core trust seal. Um, so, implementing those, uh, as a conclusion, implementing uh, or inter integrating those P2 services has brought a, a new level of quality in the uh, uh, long-term long -term preservation service that we uh, deployed. And um, um, hopefully having it certified will um, help us new communities uh, on board. So that's me done. So you, Johannes. Thank you very much, Olivier. Um, we have already a very interesting question. Uh, please uh, also ask uh, questions via the um, via the chat window. Um, so um, one question from, from Niklas is, um, um, are there any uh, non-domain specific data repositories in Europe uh, that have sought or gained TDR certification with uh, Core, Trust, Core Trust seal? So the question uh, that I might want to add to this uh, is, uh, is, are, is, it, is it possible and useful to have a non-domain specific data repository certified? Well, that, that's exactly what CNES is about. Um, mm -hmm. may, maybe have a, uh, we'll add after that, but uh, CNES is completely a community agnostic. Mm -hmm. um, we have some social science collections. We've got um, uh, space data. We've got um, um, PhD theses, which cover all the different communities. So. Um, I, I, I would say yes. Um, um, the, the, the main idea of the ETDR we, uh, is to cover all the, the, the different communities, so not to be community specific. Okay. The background of the question, if I may um, follow on uh, on this, uh, the, the background of this question um, can be regarded as um, Quattro C means um, like data seal of approval, you need to know your metadata, your metadata formats, and many of them are community specific. 
um, it's probably less cost effective if you know have a knowledge deeper knowledge in the community specific metadata rather than if you uh, if you deal with this from a generic perspective um, so so you say Sinus is able to manage this and has a business model which is also working uh, for for this ag agnostic case yes because we will have some uh, working group uh, in place, uh, working groups in place with the different communities and have uh, frequent meetings to uh, see how uh, their uh, standards uh, may evolve and how, uh, what are the, the, the immediate actions that we need to put together. So um, we've got a, 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 a generic repository or gener generalist repository, for you, uh, uh, as you like, but we've got a, a strong relationships with the different communities that are, are using our, our services. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, if there is no other question, we will have also a question answer round, but um, uh, to, to you, because your uh, presentation was um, also highlighting the integration aspect, integration with other components, which means also shifting the point of data ingest uh, to the front uh, to the front end. So it's, uh, uh, you have the TDR, the TDR is certified, but uh, you receive data also, you mentioned dance as one example. Uh, dance is using uh, the B2Share service um, as, as the front end. The question is now, what is, the, what is the effect? How much is the certification of a TDR? How, how much is the trustworthiness of the TDR uh, affected if um, a data is ingested from front end services? Is this easy? Uh, easily doable or uh, how far do we have to, uh, to care about this during the design of the integration? Well, so I, 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 I cannot see the, 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 the reason why it, it wouldn't be doable. Um, um, okay, so the, um, the, what I mean is the um, B2Share is, um, provided by a different partner, a mm -hmm. different organization. And um, uh, there's the TDR provided by another um, uh, provider. And uh, now the data ingest is being done in the repository, which is not necessarily to be regarded as part of the TDR. So the question is how much is the boundary of what TDR means um, uh, changed and extended also towards the um, B2Share plus the TDR uh, from Sinus or plus the TDR uh, at Dance, if I express myself correctly. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think a, a single point or, or, or not just one single, but I think two points of entry, B2Safe and B2Share, um, uh, will of, uh, for sure uh, uh, facilitate the work uh, 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 to make the service um, easy to use. Um, I, 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 at this point, um, each different TDR over the planet has its own entry point. Mm -hmm. So if, if we can share this, that, that will make that use of, of TDRs uh, 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 easier. Um, now, should should the, the B2Share or B2Save be part of the certification process? What's, that, that, that's an open mm -hmm. question, but, but mm -hmm. keep in mind that, that um, the, the certification is around long-term preservation. So in the end, it's the uh, uh, trust, trusted digital repository that we are looking after. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank that's you a, for- That's a really good point, Olivier, actually. Um, I think, yeah, so, well, uh, hopefully we'll answer more questions into the chat while I'm uh, rambling away in a moment, and hopefully I'll provide a little bit more more context around that we might use to address the generalist and domain thing. In Olivier's example, uh, Dance is also a trustworthy digital repository as well. So you have got um, TDRs at both ends, <clears throat> and both of the TDRs will be expected to take responsibility for the integrity of the pipeline between them. So that level of complex partnerships 
and responsibilities is a critical one. We're talking about EOSC, we're talking about interoperability and codependence and relying on others and disaggregating services. So that's really, really critical. And then from the certification side, um, not only from the certification authority side, but for those viewing a certification, a really clear boundary on what is and isn't being certified is important. And the more relationships we've got, the harder it can be to define. So I think these are really good questions and maybe we could explore them a bit more afterwards. Okay, thank you very much. This is a good um, a bridge <laughs> to your presentation, Javi. Uh, so um, Javi was already introduced in the and the introductory session, so we can just switch to your presentation, Harvey, uh, which uh, will focus, um, yes, also more a bit more on the shock um, re repositories, and um, and uh, the core trust seal and fair. So uh, it's your floor, please. Excellent. Thank you very much. So I'm presuming we can see everything, or someone will squawk if we can't. Um, yeah, so we're looking at the um, the specific shock side here, um, looking at some of the repository support that's been on offer um, and these core trust seal plus fair aspects. Um, I think that the, the pairing of Olivier's and my presentation is hopefully uh, a useful one to provide different forms of context. Thanks for the question so far. And um, I certainly hope that we'll get a few more before the end because it started quite an interesting discussion there. And like we started on probably on one of the most important topics. So yeah, I'm Hervé Lors, I'm working on SHOC uh, from the UK Data Service, um, uh, based at the University of Essex. Um, so the obligatory uh, SHOC overview project, uh, the important thing here is we've been going for a while, since January 2019, running through till the 30th of April um, 2022. So we're kind of an interesting point at the moment. Uh, you know, working on the stuff and getting a lot of integration. I know we're all looking out at the... Uh, uh, Herbert, sorry, a bit. Uh, I don't see the slides. Uh, Johannes, do you see them? No, I was just looking for them. I thought I have um, um, misconfigured here something on my screen. Okay. No, I did not. Let now, we see. Yes. thank you very much, Irena, for your remark. Yeah, there we go. Thank you very thank much. You. Squawking is welcome. Too I'm running too many screens, you see. It always gets... Uh, always gets a little bit problematic. Um, so as you'll see from here, the short partners are a, a pretty varied bunch. Yeah. So we're not only from Eric's and their repositories, but there are also representatives here from a really wide range of, you know, what we could broadly consider data services, uh, all to some extent across the social science and the humanities. Um, and that's an important aspect of this reflects the question that's just been asked is the fact that um, in terms of trust, uh, who are the actors, who are we working with? And if we consider trust to be a, a transitive context, uh, a transitive uh, concept, how do we pass that trust along and communicate it throughout these complex EOSC partnerships? Um, Shock itself, uh, you'll see at the top there, EOSC Hub project is considered to be a key input as, the, uh, as is the EOSC roadmap itself. Uh, the concept of FAIR is critical too uh, via the Fair data into reality report. The shop project itself is pretty broad ranging, covering sort of infrastructure, tools, services, certainly human centric, uh, full life cycle, uh, looking at people aspects, data aspects, and training. And it's got <clears throat> sort of larger chunks of work around specific multilingual, secure access, and open science work. Um, a range of work packages uh, across the board here, some of which will be presented elsewhere during the course of the, the event. <clears throat> but particularly at the moment, we're looking at work package eight on governance, sustainability, and quality assurance. Uh, work package eight is pretty broad ranging in itself. Um, it's looking to develop a governance model for the SSH aspects of the European Open Science Cloud. Um, how we manage stakeholder involvement and sustainability over time, looking at harmonizing data policy um, and like aligning the strategic activities and exploiting the synergies between these two groups. Again, it's a partnership model. Um, looking specifically at the quality and ethical requirements for research data. Um, and that's where some of this comes in, looking at certification and then pushing that out into training and offering support. Um, 
And then from there, from this SSH boundary, we're looking at cross-disciplinary coordination and cooperation. The SSH partners are, are very engaged with a, on the boundaries of their work at cross-disciplinary work. And that adds an additional challenge, which also reflects the question about discipline that we were asked at the beginning. So within Work Package 8, uh, most of this is related directly to task 8.2 on trust and quality assurance. Um, core trust seal certification, as Olivia has outlined, is, is pretty critical there. Um, as I was briefly mentioning before in response to the question, the level of outsourcing we do and how we manage those complex partnerships is, is increasingly an extensive issue around the work that we're doing, especially if you're looking at standardization, self-assessment and certification. Um, so the outcome here is a common standardized approach to provide for consistent EOSC data providers and data sources. Um, we'll go over the, the objects and their contexts stuff in a moment as well. And then later in the project, we'll be going back to some of the more clear legal aspects, which is that I don't think we're, um, we've reached the point yet that the often mentioned technical and organizational measures uh, referenced in GDPR are kind of clarified in a consistent way. Um, as Olivier said, the organizational uh, side of FAIR is not uh, a particular focus, and that will be part of the late, later work of the, uh, the task as well. <clears throat> so we've already uh, provided one deliverable D8.2 pl certification plans for shop repositories. Uh, there's an overview of the certification status of the current repositories and a goal for each repository as well. Um, that might range from you know, an existing repository that's got core trust seal or uh, a prior certification and helping them renew. Um, it might be getting the core trust seal for the first time, but there's obviously a range of maturity issues to consider here. So the other two things that are be considered are one, whether or not the repository is uh, or the organization data service is a is a good fit for core trust seal at the moment. That's an active discussion. Um, and the other one is certainly to help organizations which are still on this journey. Uh, the notion of the notion of journeys is important to core trust seal. Um, and is increasingly part of the uh, messages we hear about FAIR. We're not expecting to be there at once. So supporting people on that journey is important. Um, and towards the end of the project, <clears throat> we'll be releasing another report, which will provide detail on what's happened. It'll be evaluating repository services, looking at the OAIS reference model um, and the various TDR terms. And it will define the criteria by which trusted services might be outsourced within the TDR model um, to support those complex partnership models. This really is an active challenge at the moment to think about how we deal with these, deal with these relationships in a, in a reliable and trustworthy way. Um, as Olivier briefly outlined, the core trust seal process is <clears throat> fairly simple. Um, you make an application for the core trust seal. You undertake an, a self-assessment against the 16 requirements, which is then submitted and reviewers are assigned. Um, I'm currently on the board and I'm a member of the assembly of reviewers as well. Um, Olivier is a, is a reviewer as well. Um, if you achieve the core trust seal, then appropriate members of your teams uh, are asked to uh, join the assembly of reviewers. Uh, this is the sustainability model for ensuring that this happens, but also ensures that the, that the core trust deal remains community driven um, and peer driven and expert driven. Um, that peer review goes through to a, a board review process and either revisions are requested uh, which are then returned to the peer reviewer or um, the core trust seal is achieved. Within the shock project, uh, we're inserted here, which is roughly where the, uh, where the logo is, looking at engaging with those repositories at an early stage, uh, meeting, helping them with their self-assessments, discussing, reviewing, responding over time and taking a fairly bespoke uh, approach to each of the repositories that's there, because as we've said, there's a, a pretty wide range of partners. Um, this is not kind of only going on here. So shock, as in some of the other pieces of work, is kind of an extension of a model which um, originally came out of the uh, out of the CESDA trust work. Uh, you know, the the early application of expert support for uh, internal peer reviews and working out in the case of CESDA, um, you know how we share evidence and best practice across an ERIC. Um, and that's evolved into the uh, CESDA Trust Working Group and various work plans year on year. 
<clears throat> now, like uh, this as to trust model, the shop model provides direct support for interested repositories and is confidential. Uh, it remains confidential during the course of the process, and then it is up to the uh, repository to submit their application to the core trust seal, which also, uh, for reference, remains confidential itself. And uh, that's a really important aspect of that. You can submit something to the core trust seal and get uh, multiple rounds of feedback and support without having to, uh, I think the English phrase is, air your dirty washing in public. Um, you know, and if this will become uh, public and will be fully public uh, once your uh, application is approved. Um, but alongside that, we'll also be providing wider supporting materials, which will be completely open. And I think those two sides of confidentiality and openness are, are really important aspects of keeping people on board. Um, you'll see similar activities for support going on in projects like EOS Nordic, uh, which is looking at repository support with uh, additional FAIR elements. Uh, Olivier noted that the uh, Active FAIRs FAIR project, which I'm also working through at the moment, is looking at Core Trust Seal plus FAIR, which uh, is a reflects the diagram that you'll have seen from Olivier and we'll see from myself, <clears throat> and also looking at maturity, which we think is a, an important, uh, important element of you know, how capability is expressed, how mature, maturity is defined, and how this impacts your ability to not only achieve core trust seal or to be fair, but to, to kind of measure yourself on the journey. Um, I'm sure there are many other uh, related or per, uh, parallel efforts going on. Uh, any information about those is always welcome. Um, and the big question about all these is what happens next? Um, I know that FAIR and SHOCK uh, and EOS Nordic have all talked about uh, being able to come up with a sustainability model for ongoing mutual support, uh, streamlining the kind of work that we do to simplify not only gaining core trust deal, but renewing it over time, because managing that evidence and responding to changes in core trust seal is another active piece of work. Um, and we're really looking to try and get that beyond this current round of, of project focuses and, and, and build a kind of a wider community there. Um, back inevitably to the core trust seal, um, 16 requirements as Olivier outlined. Um, I'll go over those in slightly more detail in a moment, but something to look on previous to that is that these mandatory responsibilities that come from the OAIS, which maybe helps to put some of this into context. Um, you know, a data producer needs to be able to uh, have in, negotiate with and have information accepted by a repository team. <clears throat> We're looking for documented policies and procedures, sufficient control for long-term preservation. You know, the management of the rights to allow you to do this is non-trivial. Um, and then there's the key concept of the designated community, you know, the, the target knowledge base and the target area of work of your <clears throat> community of users. As Olivier said, these could be um, either uh, general purpose, general public users or disciplinary users. You'd need to reflect that in your application, but you need to make the information independently understandable for them. <clears throat> and that when we say them, we mean a defined group. Um, and make the data available and assure authenticity over time. And this is kind of the, this OAS concept really is core uh, to providing active preservation over time and moving away from the kind of snapshots that Olivier talked about um, and a bit further into the area of looking into the future. Um, Olivier mentioned um, <clears throat> next year or next decade assurances. <clears throat> and I think I'd, I'd counter that slightly by saying, what you're really looking for in the first instance is to be able to cope with the next round of change. The next round of change to the knowledge base of that designated community, the formats that they demand, their metadata needs or anything else. <clears throat> and have an organizational infrastructure in place that lets you keep on responding to the next round of change over and over again and looking far enough ahead that you're prepared to do this. Um, this is, I think, how you move from this snapshot to this, this time concept. Now, it's reasonable to say that you know, preservation itself is expensive, not necessarily everything needs to be appraised as, as needing long term disciplinary preservation. But I think the biggest area of risk here that we can all acknowledge is that there is there is really a long tail of at risk data that's still out there. Um, we've probably all done it ourselves, or at least know someone that we can accuse of having done it. And as you move out of that long tail of risk at risk data, um, you're looking to make sure that the static bits are technically well managed yeah 
Um, from there, you can look at dynamic management of both the objects and the users, um, you know, full data management. And then if you can do all of those things below, at that point, you're probably uh, ready to do some disciplinary preservation by getting the additional information you need. Um, you know, I think this is a this is a foundational, a set of foundations to increase trust over time. But any step away from the long tail of at risk data is is broadly beneficial to to what we're trying to do here. Um, one of the important things is uh, is not just what level the data is being cared for, but that that level of care is is clear. You know, you might not need a, a full disciplinary preservation level, but it should be clear to the data depositors and users what level of care is in place. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to briefly go through these in case it triggers any questions. Um, in terms of organizational infrastructure, we need to know your mission and scope covers the role, that you're doing decent rights management through licenses, continuity, continuity of access as an organization, disaster recovery, <clears throat> business continuity, succession planning, confidentiality, confidentiality and ethics, including having a decent legal framework, your governance structure, your organizational infrastructure there, um, seeking external expert guidance, at the core of this is digital object management. Can you assure the integrity and authenticity of the documents? Do you undertake appraisal? How do you make decisions about the document, the data that you accept? Documenting your storage procedures, not purely about long-term storage here, but more about day-to-day -day good storage practices from a curation perspective. The critical thing that's at the heart of all this, which is an active preservation plan. Um, measures that you take to curate for data quality, documenting your workflows, enabling data discovery and identification, and enabling data reuse. And then finally here, stuff which kind of came up in much more detail as the core trust seal kind of evolved from WDS and, and the data seal of approval, looking at the technical infrastructure and security aspects. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that these are a core of core sharing information. There's no um, IT services management aspect to this, um, but it's certainly a good starting point for sharing peer information. So this is the core trust seal in context. You'll see the other unpleasant looking orange lines or jars in the middle there, which show the appraisal quality discovery and reuse stages that get gone through to kind of deliver these data over time. But that's not all. Um, the activities at the moment of the EOSC Fair Executive Board Working Group um, are focusing on developing reports for both certification not just in terms of uh, repositories, but looking at wider data services as well, and some of the metrics that we apply to uh, digital objects, which brings us to the inevitable fair aspects of all this. <clears throat> so the fair principles themselves, um, they're our starting point for thinking about a lot of these, uh, fairly stable, but they don't come on their own. We might have the nice simple four letters in our FAIR acronym, but there are 15 principles altogether. Uh, groups like the RDA FAIR Data Maturity Working Group have delivered 40 plus indicators for these. And those indicators make it very clear that you know, working on them is down to the local application. So we're at the stage at the moment where people are developing metrics uh, against which you can define specific tests for fairness. Um, I think the general agreement is that these need to be informative and supporting rather than uh, judgmental and exclusionary. Um, but, you know, these are these human and machine mediated tests are an important part of making progress here. Um, as you'll have seen from the introduction, we're looking for, to join the repository certification to the object context in some way. Um, across this, we've got to look at our object data, our object metadata. And the repository is also responsible for process metadata and other business information. And this is kind of where the evidence comes from um, of your core trust seal practice. To get either the objects or the repository certified, we need to be looking at kind of a fairly standard model for assessment and evaluation, looking at what the standard requirements are, having an assessment process, which is clear to us. Um, that assessment process really uses evidence um, against the attributes about an entity, repository, data, or whatever, to uh, come up with some kind of conclusion, to reach a, a status evaluation at the end. And you need to have that for, for both sides of the equation. Um, what we're looking at at the moment is how we take the objects and their collections and undertake object assessment, uh, manual or automated, 
and repository assessment um, and bring these together into a core trust seal plus fair model. Um, we really are looking for something which uh, shows that the repository is enabling fair data in some way. This is very much in progress, but this does give you both, both sides of it for repositories as the, the context for objects. Um, we've seen this one a couple of times. This is where we stand at the moment. Uh, feedback and engagement is welcome. There will be multiple other versions of this coming out of the Fairs Fair project, and there's already been great engagement on thinking about this. But this will change as the, uh, as the indicators and the metrics and the tests progress. So just a couple of final points on this. Here we've got the repositories and the digital objects and their evaluations, which we need to bring together. But when we're looking at the wider vision of the European Open Science Cloud, we're looking at a wider range of um, services and software, which also need to be brought into this. It's not only the, uh, the repositories that rely on those services and software that's presented here, but it's a much broader piece. Um, and eventually bringing this out into the layer of registries envisioned by the uh, Turning Fair into Reality report um, so that they can support an operational layer and that operational layer is in turn supported by evaluation, which might not be certification, it could be standards compliance, self-assessment, a variety of different approaches are in place. But we need to be able to do these across software, services, repositories, people, to an extent training and skills, and of course the objects themselves. Um, just one final point on this, the shop work will um, will be pushing out recommendations. The core trust seal is an active three yearly reviewed process. Um, when we're looking at the core trust seal and making recommendations, it might be helpful to think about this in, in three different ways because core trust seal comes from a, uh, you know, a, a very strong message from the RDA that they need a single central repository data service certification mechanism, which would reach a core level and be accessible. Um, so when taking advice in from how we might uh, look at and change the core trust seal over time, um, you might be looking to integrate new items into these 16 requirements to clarify. Uh, there may be candidates to elaborate. I mean, at the moment, the core trust seal plus fair is an elaboration. These things map into each of these requirements. Um, and in the end, if there need to be more requ requirements, then we need to look at extension. But a big part of this is the fact that we have got a community standard here with a three yearly community review. So we're not only showing how people can meet those requirements, but we're also learning how we can feed back into those requirements to improve them over time, uh, including plus fair, but also beyond. Um, we'll share the presentation afterwards. Um, there are a number of references here that might be of interest. Um, and overall, thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much, Javi. Um, so I'm looking to the time. So uh, we have uh, some minutes <laughs> for the discussion. Um, uh, so there aren't, there have not been any additional questions uh, so far from others. Uh, so I try to motivate some questions. Uh, so I added one. Um, this is um, how far is the shock certification plan that you mentioned? Uh, based on previous work. Um, uh, you mentioned this already partially. So uh, SESTA, I think was mentioned. Um, previous work, so I, I know that for instance, Clarin were very active also in certifying their, uh, their different um, uh, domain specific uh, or very specific repositories. Uh, how, how far is this integrated in the work of Shock? So um, for, I think it's Clarin B members, it's. Uh, Attaining core trust deal is a uh, is a requirement as part of their part of their sort of their growth process themselves. They've been very active with within the core trust deal and engaged. Um, says the members have to um, follow the annex two uh, requirements of says membership, which means evolving towards the core trust deal over time. You know, so both of these have had have been important elements. Um, the SSH area itself was kind of fairly fundamental in developing the original uh, data seal of approval uh, standard, um, but it was never envisaged as being purely social science and humanities. Um, I think maybe to reflect the question that happened that came up earlier, um, the notion of a trustworthy digital repository has been maybe conflated with the idea of a disciplinary repository. 
uh, over time. Um, and it's something that uh, is part of an active uh, sort of request for feedback from Core Trust Seal. Core Trust Seal is not there to tell you whether or not you are a good SSH repository or a good, you know, if you're running CERN, you're running telescopes, you're running whatever. Core Trust Seal is not providing granular disciplinary evaluation. But it's become pretty clear that with organizations like Science Europe strongly recommending deposit in a disciplinary trustworthy digital repository, that Core Trust Seal is going to need to clarify in some way, maybe in the metadata that they submit to something like RE3 data, whether the certification is for a generalist or a specialist repository in some way. And I think that's important to users. But I think it's also important to note that that's where the boundary is. Yeah. If you claim to be a specialist repository with a specialist designated community, your core trust seal reviewers will expect to see evidence that you meet those needs um, in the evidence you provide. It's no good pretending to be a disciplinary repository and then providing purely generic metadata, purely ge generic format support and claiming to only support the, generic, the general public. Yeah, these are two different things. But there's no practical way that the core trust seal can become you know, endless experts in every area of every discipline when most of those disciplines don't have equivalent agreed standards to meet. Yeah. Um, so I think at the moment, uh, we're looking at doing that line. The elaboration model there would maybe allow a particular discipline to say, and we have these additional standards, can you evaluate for these? Um, but I hopefully call trust seal as well as seeking a clear boundary on what it certifies, is looking to place a clear boundary on what its role is um, and provide a way of cooperating with others. In terms of previous processes, Clarin's been very active. Clarin's very active on shock as well. Cest is very active on shock. Um, I think I'd say that in two ways. One is we start off with general purpose information and support for Core Trust Seal. Yeah. Um, you know, informing people what it is, justifying what it is, trying to communicate to people that most of Core Trust Seal involves writing down the things you need to run a decent service and then making them public so other people can see them. Yeah, if you do that well, then maintaining and renewing Core Trust Seal shouldn't be too hard. If you panic and create a bunch of documentation just for certification, and then forget about it for three years until someone comes and asks you about it again, you will probably find it a more complicated process. So yes, thank thank you uh, for this answer. Um, we have just two minutes left. Uh, can I ask another question from Niklas uh, or Olivier? Do you wanted to also to add to this? No, no, no. What was crystal crystal clear? I think so. yes. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, Niklas, Niklas was asking, um, as a member of task team uh, in, in RDA interest group, uh, he's doing uh, work on prof professionalizing data stewardship and he's interested in the model presented here. Are there materials underlying or feeding into the graphics available somewhere? So is there more material available that's actually the the question. So I can imagine a mail to you can also help you. Yep. I think you'll find my emails at the end of the presentation. It's herveyessex.ac.uk. Um, I think every diagram that I've presented is in one of the publications that's right. listed in the references. Um, but I'm also happy to help you find something as there's quite a few there if you're interested. Okay, thank you. Then there's another question, question three. Uh, I find it hard to assess whether the core trust seal reflects the fair data principles. Apparently, the core trust seal web page does not refer to the FAIR principles. What is the relationship? So, Olivier or, or, or uh, Heavy? Yeah, it, 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 it doesn't reflect uh, uh, or it doesn't uh, reference the FAIR principle as of yet because it was created way earlier than the FAIR principles. And um, the one, one of the, the, the work that we are uh, uh, doing at the moment is the mapping between the FAIR principles and the core trust C, uh, uh, criteria and, and uh, uh, an evolution of, of the core trust seal certification will potentially be to integrate those uh, FAIR aspects. Maybe that the criteria will be elaborated to integrate those FAIR principles, but at, at the moment they don't. Okay. 
Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the time is actually over and uh, I'm not so sure if we get one or two minutes. Um, uh, I think it's better not to assume this because you also want to go to your next sessions in between, uh, have your lunch break. So I thank you very much for the presentations, also for answering the questions. Uh, Irena, is there something you want to add? I would not technically. I would just like to invite everyone uh, to join the the, the boots, the so the expert presentations, and to join us uh, at next sessions that uh, start at uh, two. Um, but there's also another two days, uh, so please join us. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, we save. I think we save the uh, the the chat right so by the notes. Yeah. So the chat is, is saved, okay. Thank you very much. So I close the session and I wish you a good afternoon and a visit of the booth. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you, bye. bye.